when doctors or when employees at Veterans Affairs Canada put suicide on the table as a way out, then they sharply send the message to the sufferer that maybe their life is not worth living. Euthanasia and assisted suicide in Canada. Member of Parliament Garnet Jenis urged the House of Commons earlier this year to suspend the law aiming to expand the practice to people suffering with mental illness. The law was paused for one year, a small win for the pro-life movement. But that window is quickly closing as euthanasia and medically assisted suicide will be available to people with mental illness in March of 2024. As EWTN News In-Depth reported to you over the summer, these procedures are becoming more culturally accepted and legalized around the globe. But Canada seems to now be leading the charge, with some of the most permissive euthanasia laws in the world being used there at an alarming rate. Euthanasia is legal in all of the countries highlighted in green, including the Netherlands, where they are looking to expand euthanasia to use on children. The New South Wales region of Australia will officially legalize it this November. Medically assisted suicide is legal in all the areas highlighted in purple. And in Italy, it is not legal by any legislation. It is only decided by the courts on a case-by-case -case basis. And in Germany, Parliament recently failed to agree on an assisted suicide law. Euthanasia is illegal in Germany, as it was used by the Nazis to kill more than 200,000 people with physical and mental disabilities. In Canada, they call euthanasia medical assistance in dying, or for short, MAID. Canada first legalized assisted suicide in June 2016 for adults suffering from irreversible deadly illnesses and whose death was reasonably foreseeable. Changes to the law in 2021 relaxed rules for MAID, the requirement for the patient to give final consent immediately before the procedure was dropped. That is intended to ensure someone approved for euthanasia can still get it if they lose mental capacity before it's carried out. The new guidelines also removed the requirement for a person's natural death to be reasonably foreseeable. The changes also expanded access, instead of only those with a terminal illness, to those with a serious and incurable illness where the patient says their suffering is intolerable. Since 2016, more than 30,000 Canadians have used the country's assisted suicide law to end their own lives. The numbers have steadily risen since its inception. The most recent reports indicate a major jump from 7,400 deaths in 2020 up to 10,000 in 2021. That's an increase of more than 34 percent. The official numbers for 2022 have not been released yet, but the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition estimates more than 13,000 deaths associated with medically assisted suicide laws in Canada took place last year. There are multiple organizations that are advocating for euthanasia, including one called Dying with Dignity. I had an experience with accompanying a family member uh, on her journey in assisted dying. One of the things that has come out, I think, uh, in the last few years is the therapeutic value of individuals being advised that they are eligible for an assisted death. We all want the luxury of, of, a, of a good death. I think, unfortunately, I would count myself uh, amongst a group of Canadians that have unfortunately had the experience with a bad death. It's, it's critically important and fundamentally to, to Canadian to realize that uh, it is your choice. It's your life and it's your choice. Dying with Dignity Canada labels itself a human rights charity. The organization provides step-by-step -step guides on how to request and access medically assisted suicide. It also holds webinars, talks, events, and petitions Parliament to expand access to euthanasia in Canada. The College of Physicians of Quebec, or CMQ, also supports the medical aid in dying laws, most recently calling for the expansion of MAID to severely disabled people. The region of Quebec stands out in Canada, leading the nation in people who have received assisted suicide. Projections from Quebec's Commission on End-of-Life Care says Quebec may finish this year with 7% of all deaths there from physician-assisted suicide. Commission President Dr. Michel Bureau says that's three times more than Belgium, where it has been legal for more than 20 years. In a recent letter to doctors, he warned them to stick to the law, citing 15 cases where doctors may have violated the guidelines. And we're joined by two people who know this subject very well. Amanda Actman is founder of the Dying to Meet You Project. And Peter Stockland, the publisher and editor of Catholic Register in Canada, has years of reporting on the evolution of medical aid and dying laws. Peter, how did Canada get here? What happened over the course of the last 15 years? 
Real short uh, snapshot. I've been watching this uh, unfold for, well, since the early 90s. In, uh, there was a uh, Supreme Court decision called Rodriguez, which actually upheld the existing uh, uh, anti-euthanasia, anti-assisted suicide law. Um, and so it, there was a kind of slow creep for, for a, a decade or so. And then the, the um, forces, a dying with dignity group and, and, and a pro, pro uh, euthanasia, pro maid, as we now call it, forces really, really began to get traction. And, it, and in 2015, the Supreme Court reversed itself and said that the law was not, in fact, constitutional. And that absolutely opened the floodgates. There was legislation passed in 2016. And, you know, I was at uh, a, a series of follow up um, uh, events when that uh, when the, after that legislation was past. And you could tell um, then that the, the ink wasn't even dry on the legislation and the, the pro-made, pro-euthanasia forces were out in force, just pushing, pushing, pushing to have it expanded. And um, in 2021, there, were, there was, uh, right in, the, in the, the heat of, of COVID, there was another effort to expand it, which, uh, which uh, further weakened what, whatever uh, what, uh, legislation was in place. And now we're at a point where a year from now, we're going to be um, giving made to mentally ill people. There was that would actually be the case now, but um, but there was such a pushback to it that that the, the federal government introduced legislation uh, stalling that 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 for a year. So we've gone in the in the space of my working life from a, a constitutional. Uh, agreement that made was was could be legally regis, uh, legislated against to uh, the simple as I say the floodgates open and there are cultural issues at stake here too Amanda we just watched snippets of some pro euthanasia videos in Canada what impact are they having on the culture these messages that uh, that euthanasia is a good thing the the organization dying with dignity starts by talking about how their goal is to remove unwanted suffering. And since most suffering is unwanted, they have found a lot of resonance with that. Suffering is a mystery. Suffering is not simple or easy or uh, something that we're, we're ready-made to contend with. That's why it's so important that we who are pro-life put out a positive, proactive message to counter these, that there is a better way that can face up the mystery of suffering not with solutions, but with accompaniment. And until we put forward a more alternative, a more beautiful alternative vision, those other messages might gain, continue to gain resonance, even as they are a real counterfeit that do not do justice to people. Helping people find purpose in their suffering. Peter, now, how have we seen the church, which knows this so well, respond to, respond to this progression of medical aid and dying laws in Canada? When the... Uh first legislative initiative uh, was put forward back in 2016. The, the church was really aggressive. I watched Cardinal Collins at one of the one of the hearings, and he was absolutely phenomenal. The even the Quebec bishops, who tend to be very very shy about getting involved in public uh, brouhaha's, put out some very very strong statements. Um, since then, the the church has it's been it realized that the the fight that it's in and i think it's gone into a more uh, quiet mode uh trying to, to to keep the faithful as amanda just said keep the faithful active in it rather than it kind of being the voice of the church from above but um i was at the the cardinal's dinner last winter in uh in in toronto and cardinal collins um in front of 1300 people he was giving his talk, a, talk, a general talk, and then he started talking about euthanasia and made. And he just looked at everybody and he said, "What have we become? Mm. What have we become?" And he sent those thirteen hundred people out of that room with that message ringing in their ears. And and I think it, you know, it, there's a percolating effect there where it does galvanize again, as Amanda has said, it galvanizes the pro-life movement. But man, this is an uphill struggle, or or you know, from swimming against the tide, whatever metaphor we want to use this has just taken off in Canada and to fight back against it the, the church is doing all what it can I think uh, um, but boy oh boy it's it's tough you've got the force of government against you Amanda made is also piquing an interest of funeral homes and businesses offering rooms where assisted suicide can be administered by a professional your family can be there you can design your own experience is this a fad or a trend there's a sense in which euthanasia kind of goes along with a social media culture that would want to curate all of the moments of life 
to be perfect, picture perfect. But life's not like that. We know that life is messy. And when we reflect on the moments that are deepest and most intimate, they're usually the ones that we don't broadcast or tweet about. And if you think about being at the bedside of a dying person, no one thinks about taking out their camera to live stream it. So I think this is a call for us to reflect on what is the true nature of intimacy and presence and how can we cherish those moments that we're not always being broadcast as we live our lives on social media, but that nevertheless make us deeply human and are worth savoring. Peter, we've talked about some of these actors that are in play here. The United Nations human rights experts have expressed concern that euthanasia is being given to patients with non-terminal illnesses and found the laws discriminatory to those with disabilities. What can you tell us about whether this actually has weight? I know that the UN hasn't been great on abortion and other life issues. Right. In fact, um, not only the UN, but the actual board that oversees made and uh, euthanasia here in Quebec, where, where I live, has said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. There, there are people who are way outside the bounds and they're receiving it. Seven percent of deaths in Quebec now are as a result of made. So, the, you know, the UN, I mean, it's it's kind of top down. But right here on the ground, people are simply ignoring it. And as I said earlier, this has become uh, just people are understanding this as just a way to leave their leave life. Um, and so, you know, the UN can add its voice to that. But when our own regulatory bodies and, and uh, you know, whatever politicians are involved can't control it, I don't give much hope to the, uh, to the UN to being able to influence uh, public opinion right. either. Right, when you've got the force of the prime minister against you. Well, Amanda, you get the last word really quickly. What actions should pro-life organizations do to combat this issue, the laity? Well, I'm so pleased to share that tomorrow I'm organizing a day-long event in my home diocese where I was born and raised, Diocese of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. And the theme of the day is the church as an expert in humanity. This was a term that uh, Pope used when he addressed the United Nations. Paul VI used this and said, we come here as an expert in humanity. And so this is about instilling the church with confidence that we are actually prepared to meet the crises of our time, of loneliness, grief mental illness, we're prepared to meet them through ministry, accompaniment, and our confidence in the power of God to overcome even death. So we're going to have a morning ministry fair of all the exhibits that, uh, of all the ministries that are doing the best work around these areas of end of life to celebrate and affirm the good work we're doing in the church already. And then we're going to have an afternoon of panels and then an evening of testimonies with seven different speakers from the community addressing the real issues in the church um, so that they can speak in the presence of the bishop uh, as echoes of the seven last words of Christ. The church is an expert in humanity, and we have reasons to be confident about, confident about that. Absolutely. That's a galvanizing call and one that we hope that other dioceses and other churches will pick up uh, to following your example. Thank you both for this important conversation. Thank you. Thank you.